Hi, everyone. Patrick here. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Wealth Standard Podcast. We're still talking about entrepreneurship, and we're going to take a different angle today. Uh, my guest is Mike Moyer. He is the author of Slicing Pie, Fund Your Company Without Funds. Uh, and there's an updated version, <clears throat> which is Slicing Pie Handbook. Uh, he also has a really cool software that is, is used to equitably track the non-cash uh, expense side of things. Anyway, it's a very, very fascinating uh, book and uh, and software as well. And his reach is huge, and you'll hear that in the in the interview because most uh, startups end up in uh, legal dispute uh, because most partnerships or most companies start as partnerships, 50-50 or 33-33-33. It's like it's cut just you know down the you know down the down the line depending on how many founders there are. It's very interesting, and so uh, Mike figured out a way to equitably track it. He sold, he sells thousands of books a month. He uh, also works uh, around the world. The book's been translated into multiple languages. You definitely want to pay attention to this. I think there's relevance to the the content, the things we get into, to any size of uh, a business of how you value uh, value something that's not necessarily uh, cash related, uh, but also how you value cash. But also one other thing, if you guys want to stick with me to the end, uh, and I'm on video right now, obviously if you're listening, it's audio as well, but um, I'm going to hold up the bottle here. You're going to see the bottle in the frame uh, of the video, but this is something that uh, I was sent for my birthday by my mom, and it was uh, based on an archaeological dig in New York City, and uh, these bottles will, were pulled up that has to do with an ancestor of mine that formed the original mineral water company in the United States. So I'm going to tell a little story uh, at the very end of the of the podcast. So if you guys want to listen to that, stay tuned. Uh, if not, totally fine too. But Mike, uh, I think you're going to enjoy the interview with Mike. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, go back and check out the previous episodes on entrepreneurship and also the uh, you know the previous seasons as well. So thewellstandard.com is where you'll get the show notes as well as previous episodes, but also go into iTunes, give us a good review that always helps helps to, to keep us present for those that are looking for uh, ways in which they can uh, broaden their perspective on wealth strategy, entrepreneurship, and uh, other things financial. Okay, that's it. I'm going to get to my interview with Mike. Hope you guys enjoy. See ya. Okay, Mike, it's, uh, it's awesome to have, you, uh, to have you on. Thank you for taking the time today. You're welcome. So, Mike, I mean, I've, I've, known, I've known you for a couple, couple of years, connected with you at different events. And you know you have an intriguing way in which you you look at uh, entrepreneurs, and it's it's more of what entrepreneurs don't usually uh, realize when they're starting because they're so focused on the idea and the and the product and so forth. So why don't you you know take take an opportunity just to talk to listeners about uh, what you discovered in the the startup world, the entrepreneur world, and how you've helped them and guided them to minimize failure and and, and maximize success. You mean in general or with regard to equity splits? Hey, just in just in general. Maybe start general and then get into equity splits. Well, in general, you know, so many entrepreneurs they want to go out and raise a lot of money and and grow fast and grow big. And they, if you look at our heroes of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, we want to become these awesome entrepreneurs, these celebrity entrepreneurs, and it's just so likely, so unlikely that it's it's not worth worrying about. Everyone's swinging for the fences all the time. I've made a pretty decent living as an entrepreneur. I'm proud of having made a living as an entrepreneur. But um, I, I, I hit singles and doubles, not home runs all the time. So I think most entrepreneurs that make a living as an entrepreneur um, do so by um, hitting singles and doubles and a couple of triples here. And because people are always swinging for the fences, they always want to grow as fast as they can, raise a lot of money as fast as they can, which I think causes a lot of problems. So I think we always want to bring you back to, to, the, to the bootstrapping concept where you can invest, the idea is to invest as little amount of money as possible and get the most return. So I get ROI, just how, how, do you, how do you solve your problem with, with the least amount of money as possible? And Lean Startup, I still know you the Lean Startup book on your, on your, on your desk there. My book stack, yep. Which is a great tool, a great concept. Um, the one thing that I encourage people to change with the concept, instead of minimally viable product, I want to make people do minimally valuable product. And by valuable, I mean the minimum you can charge for. So I see a lot of entrepreneurs building products and giving away for free and having free beta testers. And this, this whole process creates a false sense of 
value creation. Someone will use, so I know you can get away for free. I know people will, will, will use it for free and not pay for it, but will they actually pay for it? Hmm. So the, the, one of the big things that has been missing from the equation often is the uh, is the idea of capturing revenue very early on. And the other side that I like to work with entrepreneurs on is the whole idea of what, what are your cost structures? What does it actually run, cost to run your business if you were running it? So entrepreneurs are unique and they, they can finance themselves by not paying for stuff. Everyone else has to finance themselves by taking out loans or selling equity or earning money. We have to pay for our, pay our bills. The startups don't have, to pay, don't have to pay their bills. So this idea of we can finance ourselves by not paying for stuff gives us a false sense of what our costs are. So I work with a lot of student entrepreneurs. And they'll say, we can, under, we can undercut the big boys because our costs are so low. The only reason your costs are low is because you're not paying yourself, you're not paying rent, you're working out of your dorm room. So those, those are real costs that you're just not paying for some reason because you don't have to or you can get it for free. But you want to understand what those costs are so that you can um, yeah, understand the, 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 the economics behind your business. Those are two areas that I focus a lot on. And of course, the third one is um, how you divide up the equity in the startup company. So maybe get into that because that's, the, that's what initially intrigued me is you know, the, the way in which most companies, I, I would assume, start is, is typically in a, uh, you know, just a simple divide, divide it in half, right? 50, 50, 50. But the way, some of the things you just, just said are, are vital because there, isn't, there often isn't consideration for all the value involved in starting up a, in starting up a company. So can you maybe go through and walk through that, that whole theory, that idea, uh, and then maybe use some, some examples? Yeah, so, uh, so equity is supposed to be the first deal people do. The first thing they do is sit down with partners and they say, how are we going to split the equity? And like you said, a lot of them go 50-50. The majority of startups go 50-50. They say, we're, we're, we're buddies, we're friends. Let's go half and half. Um, or they'll say, you know, it was your idea, so you're more important than me, so you get 51%. Or you're a lot more important than me, so you get 60%. And no matter what number you pick, it's going to be wrong because things always change. The only way to get your equities bit accurate is to be able to effectively predict future events. So my equity bit is based on what you're going to do in the future. So you, you promise to work full time, for instance. Or you promise to work really hard. You promise to give me, like, give me a lot of customers. Or you promise that you're going to build a great brand or you promise you're going to invest money, or I promise you that we're going to be worth a lot of money, or I promise you that we're going to raise money. If I could predict the future, I could get it right. But because I can't predict the future, I can't get it right. And that's the biggest mistake people make, is that they go into this and they divide equity in advance of any work being done. And because they can't predict the future, they have to renegotiate later on. And renegotiation means it's something along the lines of, I don't feel like I have enough equity. So I'm going to come to you and say, I don't have enough, I'm trying to get you to give me some of your equity or reduce your holdings. People who have more than equity, more equity than they deserve rarely bring it to people's attention. If you have less than you deserve, or you feel like you deserve, you always bring it to people's attention, or you feel miffed or, or taken advantage of. So one of the problems we have is, if I give you 50% of my company and I, you do all the work, you feel like you're short-sheeted. So your motivation level goes way down. So if I give you 10%, you may feel good about it for the first six months, but the next six months, you don't feel too good about it. Or if you had a, if you had a 50% cut and I, we renegotiate a 30% cut and you're still doing the same amount of work, it's a problem. So no matter what happens in the future, it's going to be wrong. And it's, it's a fundamentally flawed system. All the advice we hear along those lines is just plain wrong. And it's, it's, it's extremely common for people to make mistakes. The attorneys I've talked to estimate that 60 to 80% of all equity deals wind up in disputes that requires legal intervention. That means the chance of your equity split failing is greater than the chance of it succeeding. And this is a problem that I personally dealt with throughout my career and it made, made me petrified to work with partners, frankly. And when I did, I often got screwed. One time I was on the receiving end of a bad equity split. I mean, I got more than I deserved. It was great. I made a lot of money. It was fantastic, but I didn't really deserve it. Um, but most of the time it was just me getting screwed because I didn't know better. But now I know better. And the slicing pie model, which I've written several books about, is a solution to that problem and solves it 100%. And it, and it even extends to, you know, intellectual property, to, you know, uh, office space, to, uh, you know, cash contribution. Like you have, you have a, a way to value uh, all monetarily in a sense, like with, with you know, uh, slices of pie, right? But you have a way to, to value 
really all everything that goes into a company, whether it's the market value of one of the, the founders who is taking a 50% pay cut, whether it's, you know, office space that's, uh, or, you know, even with the college students you talked about, I mean, they're paying rent. So there's, va- there's value there if, if it's, you know, being used partly for a, for a startup. So, so maybe talk, to, uh, talk about that before we move forward is just how, you know, how you discovered all these different ways to, all these different pieces to a startup that were valuable that weren't necessarily taken into consideration with the traditional model. And that's, that's a really good point. So in startups, we tend to concentrate on what the future is going to hold. There's, there's unknowable things, predictions about the future. What is it going to be worth? If I think it's going to be worth a billion dollars and I give you 1% of that, you're going to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. So this whole thought, this whole focus on the future, what, what, what you got to realize, what most people don't realize is that everything has a fair market price. Most companies that are, that are in business, established companies, pay their bills. You're in business, you pay your bills. I'm in business, I can pay my bills. If I go to the doctor expecting to pay his bills, everyone's bill is paid. The startups don't pay their bills. So the value of something is what you would have paid if you did pay. So if I'm you know, stuck in someone's garage, you know, if, 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 if McDonald's wants to build a restaurant in my garage, they got to pay me. If a law firm wants to you know, license my likeness for their logo, they have to <laughs> give me a license. Companies, companies that can pay do pay. So we do pay for we do pay for employees. We do pay for rent. We, we pay for supplies and equipment. All these things have fair market values, and then the price that you would pay if you could pay, because you will be paying when you can pay. Your company is you know a hundred million dollar in financing. You're going to pay for your rent. You're going to pay for your salaries. You're going to pay for your travel expenses. So everything has a fair market value, and that's the part that's, that we got to focus on is what would we pay if we could pay. It's always the same question. What would I pay if I could pay? And then I keep track of that. And by, by keeping track of what I would pay, it gives me a feel for what my company's cost structure is going to be when it actually becomes in full force. Because when I reach break even, that means I'm paying for everything. I can't reach break even if I'm not paying full salaries. I can't reach break even if I'm not paying my rent because I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, fall, I'm overstating profits and understanding expenses. So a break even implies a fully loaded expense report. Income statement, income expenses. So that's that's one thing that's the that's, that's that's the starting point. Yeah. So you and you have a you know you have an on- online software. Your book talks a, a lot about this, but you you have a way in which you you quantify that value, right? Where there isn't money to pay it, right? But you're able to quantify it so that at some future point in time, uh, it will have have essentially an equitable uh, stake going going forward. Correct. Yeah, the best way to think about it is a game of blackjack. Do you know how to play blackjack? Uh-huh. So let's pretend that you and I go play blackjack together as a team, not as opponents, but as a team. And we're friends, so we're going to split the winnings 50-50. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. All we know is that we're going to be friends, we're going to have a good time playing the game. So you go to the table, we to a $1 on the same hand of blackjack. The dealer deals two aces. So we're going to split the aces and double down, right? I'm out of cash and you're not, so you put two more dollars down. So you've got three dollars and I've only got a dollar. <clears throat> we still don't know if we're going to win or how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. The future is still unknowable. What we know for certain is that you've got three dollars and I've got a dollar. If we win, does 50 50 sound fair? Nope. No, it should be 75 25. That is logical, that is obvious, that is unambiguous. There's no other way to think about it. Now I got a deal for 50 50. I could sue you and probably win. Because you agreed to it, right? Yep. But just because you agreed to it, and just so they can legally enforce it, doesn't make it fair. What's fair is that your share of the winnings should be based on your share of the bets. And when you contribute to a startup, it's exactly the same thing. The, the, the bet is betting on the profits or capital gains of the company. And the value of our bet is equal to the fair market value of our contributions. So if you work for me for a year and you're worth $100,000 and I don't pay you, you have essentially bet your salary. You haven't magically bet more than your salary. You haven't bet less than your salary. You've only bet your, your unpaid portion of your salary. Now, if you take a 50% pay cut, I pay you half your salary, and you're betting the other half. If I use your garage to run my company and I don't pay you rent, you're betting the value of that rent. If you bring a screen printing press that you had in your basement to engage with the company, you're betting the fair market value of that screen printing press. If you buy a plane ticket, 
and hotel and I don't reimburse you, you're betting the value of those expenses. So everything you, you can contribute and you're not paid for a fair market value, that becomes a bet. And slicey pie is very simple. Your share of the equity is based on your share of the bets. Now maybe talk one, one thing that, uh, that wasn't mentioned is cash. Like let's say somebody, someone's like the silent part, not silent partner, but maybe a partner that isn't gonna actively work in the company, but puts cash in. So how would you, how, how do you value cash? Or is it the same type of value as if somebody, you know, took a, took a, a, a pay cut? Is it the same type of, uh, of value? Well, there's, there's two kinds of contributions. There's a non-cash contribution, which are things like your time, and your ideas and your relationships, things that don't require you to take cash out of your pocket. And there's a cash contribution, which is cash out of your pocket. And so if I paid you $100 an hour to work for me and you wanted to buy something that cost $100, how long would you have to work for me to get to earn enough money? Say that, say that one more time. So if I paid you $100 an hour to work for me and you wanted to buy something that cost $100, how many hours would you have to work in order to earn enough money? That's a good question. It, well, I already know the answer. So it's like, two, it's two hours, right? Because you have to pay taxes on it, don't you? Yeah, so when, you, when I pay you, I pay social security taxes and employment taxes. When you receive the money, you pay income taxes. Yeah. When you buy the thing, you pay sales taxes. Yeah. So you may have to work two hours. So cash has a higher, is more scarce and has higher taxation than non-cash. Because it's contributed after those taxes. Yeah, it's after those taxes. Plus, if you gave me a million or $100,000, would you want me to think twice before I spent it? <laughs> or just yeah. go willy-nilly. <laughs> no, you want to think. Investors want you to think twice. You have to align the interest of the, the, the investor and, and the, uh, the entrepreneur. So in slicing pie, I give you, there's, there's a unit called a slice. It's, it's a fictional unit of at-risk contributions like a poker chip. So for every dollar in non-cash you contribute, you're, you're betting two slices. For every dollar in cash, you're betting four slices. And I call those normalizers or multipliers. And those things, those, those, that formula smooths the difference between cash and non-cash and reflects the great deal of risk we take when you start a company. And so that's how you account for it. So at the end of the, when you reach break even or series A, your share is equal to your slices divided by all the slices. Just like in poker, it was your chips divided by all the chips. Cool. So this, I mean, I, I, I know we're using different, you know, different words to describe certain things. So I, I have, I have a couple of your books, but this is, uh, so this is the, this is, this is Mike's, one of Mike's book. It's, it's the actual handbook. There's slicing pie, then the slicing pie handbook. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe talk about the experiences, the successful experiences you've seen by uh, groups using this, this model. Like, do you have any uh, off the top of your head that have used this? It's been equitable and they went on to, you know, ra raise more capital, uh, capital and every, everyone was happy. Lots of examples. Uh, one of my favorite examples is a company called Cloudsploit. It's actually a case study on my website about it. This is, this is a guy who had an idea for a company and he kind of posted it to Reddit. And some guy posted back that that was a good idea. And the two of them, having never met each other, used Slicing Pie to start their company. And eight months later, they, they raised money and went on to build what's pretty, a pretty substantial company now, having never, never met each other. Hmm. So we think, oh, we have to be, you know, be really you know, find people we work with who you really trust. The Slicing Pie corrects for all that by providing the right kinds of protections. In 2010, I had published the first white paper on Slicing Pie and I distributed it to entrepreneurs as far and wide as I could. In 2012, I wrote a book called Slicing Pie. In 2015, I wrote the Slicing Pie Handbook, which is the one you have there, which is the better one. And I've had, I've, uh, it's been translated to 12 different languages. I sell thousands of copies every month all over the world. I have people, it's thousands of users on my software. Never once have I heard it not work. Huh. And I never once have I heard of a single instance where Slicing Slicing Pie couldn't solve the problem. Or as I said before, 68% of all every traditional deals wind up used to require legal intervention. So Slicing Pie, when used properly, works every time. It's a universal model, just like blackjack works the same in any country where you are. It doesn't matter, fair is fair. If our dad gives us a cookie and says, split it up, boys, the only fair way is to split it half and half because we both equally paid nothing for the cookie. If you bought the cookie, you could eat the whole thing. Fairness is not a matter of opinion, it's, it's a matter of fact. There's only one version of it. The book has been used all over the place. It was just recently translated into Persian and it's used for uh, the Iranian market, which is a very different culture, and very different economy, but it's the same model there as it is anywhere else. Yeah, I saw a presentation earlier this year 
from a gentleman from Saudi Arabia, and he he went. It was it was fascinating, just because you know the stereotype of that country is that you know it's just this war torn, you know, just very uh, uh, antiquated culture. But they have thousands of startups, and there's a huge entrepreneurial drive uh, drive there. It's pretty uh, pretty interesting. There, there has know, to be because stable employment is just you know, is, not, is not as easy to come by. Exactly. Exactly. That's very true. That'll create the environment in which entrepreneurs bud. Uh, but, but listen, yeah, it, it's so for startups, hopefully everyone's resonated with some of these, some of these points. Is there, is there relevance to existing companies that may be, you know, a couple, couple years old and they want to, they want to scale. It may require uh, capital contribution. It may require uh, debt. It may require more, more risk by some of the, the individuals. Like how, how have you worked with existing companies that are, are maybe taking things to the next level, but already established? Well, if you're already established, you, 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 your, your stock theoretically has a value already. Once your shares have a value, you don't need slicing buy. Slicing buy assumes you have a zero valuation. And I can't divide by zero, so I don't know. Uh, there's no way to value the stock, so I can't determine how much it costs to buy it, so I can't sell it. Um, and so once you have a value for your, your company, you can use the stock price of your, of your company. Now, if your company is not paying full salaries and not paying uh, its expenses, like a startup company, then your company is likely overvalued because you're not breaking even. So in order for a company to have value and not be able to pay its bills, that's just something pretty spectacular, like super loyal customers, for instance, that people are willing to invest in. But established companies can use the, their, um, their, their, their stock price. Equity is often used as a, a tool for incentives to get people to work harder. I think it's a lousy incentive. If in, in giving equity to someone in an established company is kind of a waste of time because if you, don't, if you don't value enough to buy it or somehow acquire it by not getting paid, then giving it to you is not gonna make you work harder. So if, if, you, have, if you have shares in Apple Computer, you have them because you bought them, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you went to work for Apple Computer, the fact you own the shares should not impact any way, shape, or form how hard you work for them. What will impact the way you work for them is where you get paid salary and your particular bonus and how you're managed. That matters. Your ownership in the Apple does not matter. What it does show is that you, that you believe in Apple and you think that the future is bright, but it doesn't indicate how much you're going to work. If you weren't willing to buy Apple shares, you might still work their hardest for them, but you don't, it just says you don't believe in them. So by giving it to you, I just give you something you don't value. So in the start, when you, you give equity incentive to people, it doesn't have the same impact as people think it does. What's really useful in established companies have a good bonus program, good goals and milestones planned out and manage them better. Just throwing equity at them usually doesn't work. But if you do give, have an equity, you should always give the opportunity for employees to buy into the equity using, uh, using their salary. So I'll, like I'll pay, you, I'll pay you a bonus of $10,000. You can either buy equity with it or not. Those that can buy equity with it are showing an interest in the company. The difference between publicly traded companies and private companies is private companies are harder to buy and not everyone can buy them. So having the opportunity to buy is a good, a good option for companies. Have you done much work with, uh, with Carta? Carta, the, the tracking software? Yeah, the, just the, the uh, equity, equity management platform. Um, I have done more with, with a company called CapShare. CapShare, yeah. It's more CapShare, Carta, there's a number of these companies that, that, that manage the equity split. Equity becomes so complicated so fast that Excel becomes just a kind of a lousy tool for it. And Carta and CapShare are all great companies that once your company just your, your shares of a value, it's a good tool to use. Slicing buy is for use before you reach that point. And one of the things that those companies do well is they manage different classes of stock and stock options. Um, when the money starts coming into a company through investment, it starts getting pretty convoluted in terms of how people are covering their own butts. And they'll create different classes of stock and different, different stock option programs and different uh, preferred shares and all kinds of They're things. They're not diluted. Yeah, and all kinds of rules. And each one of those classes of stock have to be, have to be tracked accordingly so you know what your outstanding stock is, otherwise it's confusing. In the beginning, we're all in the same boat. Your dollar of risk is worth the same as my dollar of risk. So I have to treat you the same. I can't, I can't give you a special class of stock if you're on my team. So slicing by always assumes we're gonna give out plain vanilla common stock to the, to the participants. And then once the, the Series A investor comes in, they can add all the rules on top of that. And you gotta decide as a startup if, the, if those rules are worth the investment. 
And the reason why I asked, so, so one of the, one of the inter, people I interviewed uh, a couple months ago was one of the founding developers of, of, uh, of Carta. And, and I found the, just the, the philosophy, the, uh, philosophy they have is, is pretty, pretty interesting. The, the CEO has this theory about how, uh, how work has evolved over the years, where it's gone from you know, a very kind of indentured servant uh, in medieval times to, you know, to slavery, to now paycheck, and then ultimately it's uh, with, with equity. And, and it's interesting in using, obviously, their, their platform, it does make it easier to, to manage and understand and value. Uh, like, what do, you, what do you think is the future of, of how equity is, is handled based on what you're paying attention to? Well, I think that it's, it's getting complicated enough that those, those programs are, are, are important. What we're, so we're seeing is it used to be that capitalism was about, the, was about owning the means of production. Now it's about renting the means of production or borrowing the means of production or leasing the means. So we don't have to own anything these days. We don't have to own a factory, we don't have to own a machine, we don't have to own a cotton gin. All we got to have is our brains and the tools are all there free for the taking. Um, but those things are all have a value and just because they're not paying for them doesn't mean they're not valuable. Um, so to the extent that we can use the equity to acquire these things, it's important. Um, but you know, there's thing, you know, Bitcoin and cybersecurity, those are all tools that are, are gonna, so we start seeing more and more of. Um, but in the early days, when you're just starting out, starting out, you don't need super tight security around those things. You just need to keep track. I think, you know, I hope the future of startups is fair equity splits. So many companies get into unfair deals that have to be unwound. It's, it's a real heartbreaker. I want people to use slicing pie and then once they bake their pie, they move on to card and, and capture and companies like that. Seed, seed Legals is another one in England that I know of. Seed Legal, yeah. Well, Mike, this has been awesome. What, are, what would you say are some things that entrepreneurs can do can do uh, to, to learn more about you, learn more about slicing pie? Like what are the best, what are the best ways to go about doing that? Well, the website slicingpie.com of course is, uh, is always up and running. And slicing pie has a, we have, we have a, we have a software called uh, the pie slicer, which is, you can which tracks your pie in real time, based on the contribution. Think about, you can do accounting in Excel if you want, or you can do it in QuickBooks. Slicing pie is to, QuickBooks, what uh, for the equity split? Uh, accounting software tracks what you do spend. Slicing pie tracks what you don't spend, hmm. which is rarely something people mostly use don't track. But the things you track in slicing pie are the things you should, you should track anyway, which are your payroll and your expenses and your things like that. Um, and of course, there's books available um, in lots of different languages, and so wherever your local jurisdiction is, there's usually a, it's a resource for you. Cool, and we'll post all those links in there. Yeah, I've used the software a couple times, and it's really, it's really simple, really straightforward, and aligns right with, uh, you know, your uh, your book and what you teach, uh, what you teach there. Well, that's all. That's all. I, I mean, Mike, this has been a great conversation. Uh, is there anything else you you think is uh, relevant to share to uh, entrepreneurs? Because I know you 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 teach in that space, right? You still teach at is it Northwestern or another university? Yeah, I teach entrepreneurship at Northwestern University these days. And you know, one of the things I always keep in mind is. Fairness is not a matter of opinion, it's a matter of fact. It's either fair or it's not. So anytime anyone says, base your split on some future assumptions, always kind of think, how can I get the fair, fair answer? There's literally one way to do this. There's, there's two ways of splitting equity. There's unfair and there's slicing pot. Okay, awesome. Well, Mike, thanks again for, for all your time. Uh, I appreciate it. I mean, this has been, uh, this has been great. So uh, I'll make sure that in our show notes online, we have all the, the links to your website as well as uh, uh, the book is the best way to buy it on Amazon or through your website. Amazon. Amazon. Okay. Well, we'll do. Uh, we'll do that. But uh, congratulations for all your success. I didn't know that uh, there was that much uh, uh, that much popularity. I mean, it's awesome. It's been translated to multiple languages, and you're selling thousands of copies a month. That's uh, that's so that's so awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay, Mike. We'll uh, we'll hopefully connect us uh, sometime in the future. Okay. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm going to take a, pic, a social media picture quick before we end, or else my team is going to kill me. All right, cool. Hey, also, I, so this is something, I'll tell you about this quick. I know you, you're probably pressed for time. So my mom sent this to me on my birthday like a week ago, and it, it was 
uh, it was the first mineral mineral uh, water company in the, in the country. And mm. it was an ancestor of ours that has my middle, my middle name, Hanbury. And uh, uh, they were, they were funded by um, uh, the, what's the, what's the, the woman from the greatest showman, the singer lady. Oh yeah. I can't remember her name. Jenny, yeah, Jenny, like Jenny the, Lind. Yeah. Jenny so, Lind. so she, inv she's the one that was the primary investor in the mineral company. Is that cool? That is cool. <laughs> was, was, it, was it full of water? No, no, it was, they, they did like some excavation in, uh, in New York city and and found a bunch of them and they just sold them on ebay my mom my mom found one so anyway you, are you gonna relaunch it what's that you're gonna relaunch it it's not a bad idea you remember packers you, you remember packers pine tar soap yeah uh, i know the guy that owns that company it's basically the brand is in the public domain and it was it's, it's the oldest consumer brand in the country and it's kind of a sleepy little company. He sells, he sells like fifty thousand dollars worth of years. There's brands out there that are kind of ripe for renewal. So if it goes, who, if it goes in public domain, then you just have to claim claim ownership over that. Is that how that how? Yeah. Works? Yeah. You remember, uh, remember, um, AIWA, AIWA back in the eighties, AIWA tapes. Huh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A friend of mine revived that brand. Is not selling products on that brand or Salon Selectives, a soap brand. No way. Those are just those are, those are relaunched brands. So basically, you can steal all their intellectual property. Or uh, Hydrox cookies. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, compared to Oreo. Yeah. Or Oreo bought the Hydrox went out of business, and Oreo bought the brand. And a guy sent Oreo customer service an email said, "Do you have any plans to release Hydrox cookies in the near future?" And the the woman's shot back said, "No, we don't. We don't have any plans to release Hydrox cookies." So that statement said, "We have no plans to use the brand." Which meant we went into the public domain, so you could pick it up and not make, not make hydrox cookies now. Okay, well, is your idea? I'll value your idea. I'll put some capital into it and I start a company. <laughs> but uh, if you but be able to claim the claim, claim the oldest mineral water company in the world is is an interesting brand to claim. Cool, the bottle looks cool too. Yeah, no, it's uh, and it's a fact. I mean, it's a story. It's a historical fact. I've I've gone into like some of the medical journals and the claim that they made. This is before they they understood that. Uh, water, like water, you know, you can get sick from water because of the, you know, illness, you know, bacteria that can live there and clean water really wasn't valued. But the, my ancestor, he was a doctor and he knew, I mean, it was big in Europe and he knew that, you know, there were some properties that would make people healthier. And that's why he started it. So it was, it was the first in the world, it was the first in the United States. What's the name? It's Hanbury Smith. Hanbury, uh, it's called Kissinger Kissingen, Kissingen Water. I and spell that. Hanbury Smith Water Company. Yeah. Can I spell Kissingen? Kissingen. Oh, it's Kiss K I S S I N G E N. I bet you find some old advertisements for it and kind of revive it. Oh, they're there. Yeah, yeah. I've I've gotten you know how Google Books they have like a warehouse of stuff in there. There's old ads, old like logo. Yeah, it's all yeah, there. Just just scrape it all and re reuse it. Yeah. Hey, that's a that's a pretty neat idea. Go retro. I, yeah, I'll book a consultation with you. We'll go through it seriously. And this bottle would be easy to make. Is it kind of is it, they got a texture? Uh, not really. It's just like yeah, it's it's green. It's green glass, and I think they had like brown ones, but I think the green glass looks a lot looks a lot better. Yeah, that's a, that's a unique that's a unique bottle for a mineral or most of them are clear. Yeah. It has like a weird kind of indent, you know, the indentation on the on the yeah. center is pretty uh is pretty interesting. No, I'm gonna I'm write I'm gonna write some I'm gonna write something up. Where do they bottle it, do you know? Uh they bottled it in New York City. So and it was it was the late late eighteen hundreds. Like eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties. Do they add anything to it, you know? I have no idea. I have no idea what the properties were. Make it up. Great, 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 grandpa. I'm going to do that. Cool. I'm going to write that up. I'm going to use it for my kids. I'll have my kids help me. Yeah. I started start a company a few years ago called uh, Mosquito Oasis <laughs> with, with my kid. He was, a, he was a Boy Scout. Yeah. And he made mosquito net tents for Boy Scout camps. And we're the largest supplier to Boy Scouts America today. Oh my gosh. Three years, three years later. 
So, you know, a kid, it's a great experience for kids. How old are your kids? Uh, five, 13, and 14. Yeah, they get all over it. 13 and 14 are really fun. Yep. My fat kid made videos and stuff at mosquitoices.com, but Kissingen is available as a domain name. I'm going to go reserve it. Yeah. This is cool. This is cool. Great. Yeah, my daughter. So this past weekend, I took my wife does this like annual party with her friends. So we went up to Park City and it, my my middle daughter, the 13 year old, she's the more entrepreneurial one. But she uh, she was asking all sorts of interesting questions. She asked me the question, like deaf people, how do deaf people describe things in their mind? Because they have never mm -hmm. heard like language. They don't know. They haven't heard words. So how do they describe it? It's like super interesting. That's weird. And then she gets it and then she goes, you know, she asked a question about the hotel because we stayed at like a really, like this is a season where it's like really cheap to stay at really nice places. Park City, and, Utah? Yeah, Park City. Yeah. Up at the St. Regis. It has this like vernic uh, vernicular. It's like an elevator system that goes to the top of this ridge and the hotel's on the top of the ridge. It's, am it's amazing. Like the Grand Budapest Hotel. What's that? Like the Grand Budapest Hotel. Grand Budapest. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that's what they modeled that whole system off of. But she asked me the question. We were sitting there eating breakfast. She's like, like, how does somebody come up with the ideas to make this? Talk yeah. about the hotel. It was, really not, it was really nice. But anyway, she's, like, she's in that kind of mindset right now. So this would be a really cool opportunity. It'd be easy to pull off. Yeah. All right, I'm going to come to you. I'll come with Megan. We'll do a consultation. Cool, man. All right, thanks for having me. Do you live in Utah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slice Pie is big in Utah. There's lots of is John Richards. You know him? No. Uh, yeah, he's the guy in Orem, the guy that has a, like uh, like some. It's kind of like an incubator type of thing. Yeah, I get a lot of lot of lot of chatter from Utah. I'd love to come do a some talks up there. Who are who, what are some of the law firms here that you that are you, you could, that know how to put together the company structure? I don't know any specific in Utah. I, I've been working with a handful of law firms the past few years, and a couple of them are kind of getting they're they're changing their focus on so to find new lawyers. Mm. If you know anybody, let me know. Yeah, I can introduce you to to mine. They're very he's he's awesome. He's like you know he has a book. They he, his main focus was estate planning, and it still is. I mean, he does tons of legacy planning. He's done a, a lot of work with the bigger uh, families in Utah, but he's brought on a lot of uh, and he's our age, and he's brought on a ton of. Uh, attorneys over the over the years and they have a, a kind of a business corporate sector so i'm gonna i'll introduce you sure yeah, i got some openings for slicing my lawyers cool i do a lot of leads all right well i'll i will uh i, I i'm gonna go reserve the name first and then i'll do the introductory email <laughs> all right see you later man thanks a lot all right mike it's good talking to you man Okay, so here's the story around this uh, this bottle, and I, I just you know played some of the stuff that Mike and I uh, talked about at the end. You know, once the official interview end, ended, hope you guys enjoyed that. But this is uh, it, it was really interesting. So you know, mineral like clean water, clean drinking water, uh, you know, mineral water was really big in Europe apparently. And so my you know ancestor Samuel Hanbury Smith and and my you know my middle name it's kind of a different middle name, but it, my middle name is Hanbury. Uh, my son, Jack, uh, his middle name is Hanbury as well. We're kind of keep it in the family. Uh, but the, this was one of the original, uh, one of my original ancestors that came over from, uh, from Sweden, I believe. And he is, uh, he was a doctor and he, uh, came over, was originally in Ohio, then went to New York city, but, uh, he founded this mineral company. And for those of you who have seen the greatest showman, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, based on uh, P.T. Barnum, uh, it it is uh, there's a there's a character in there, Jenny Lind. She's like the singer. She I'm not sure if that was her actual song or not, or it's just part of the you know part of this more modern movie. Uh, but Jenny Lind is the one that funded my ancestor. She's the one. She's the original investor. She invested the equivalent about of, of half a million dollars today, like thirty five hundred bucks back then. Uh, and invested. This was a, the, the first company and he built his plant. So I'm trying to get more information on it. There's a bunch of history there, but as you'll see, you know, Mike, uh, Mike, Mike told me, you know, you should, you should, uh, you know, get the intellectual property, the websites, the, uh, the URLs and, uh, uh, the domains, and it could be in the public domain and said to start a little company and, uh, you know, and, and maybe have it as one of those kind of novelty, uh, water companies. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to, 
Uh, I did that already. I you know, reserved the domains and going to go about getting the uh, the IP uh, if it's available. And uh, and then I'm going to uh, involve my, my kids as well. So I'll, I'll keep you guys posted on, on that. But it was kind of a novelty, especially uh, coincidental, given the fact that, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship. So now I'm going to put... Uh, you know, my entrepreneurial mind to a, a new test and involve my uh, involve my kids, and uh, we'll see what happens. I'll keep you guys uh, keep you guys posted. Okay. Anyway, that's uh, that's what I wanted to to share with you guys. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and definitely tune in next week. We have uh, more exciting guests on the on the docket. This one is one of the uh, I would say trailblazers of the entrepreneur writing space, uh, which. Uh, is Michael Gerber, who wrote the E Myth and the E Myth for pretty much every major profession that's out there. So you guys will enjoy the, that interview. Uh, but go on to go, go on to the website, thewellstandard.com, and uh, get the show notes. All of the links to Mike's books as well as his website will be there. Uh, but definitely check that out. It'll broaden your uh, knowledge of how uh, company structures work and how entrepreneurship works. I think you guys will get a kick out of it. All right, that's it. See you guys. Bye.